aperture. Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks for uh, coming, everyone. And um, my name's Arthur O. Oh. I'm a faculty in the photography program at uh, Parsons, a new school for design. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Oppenheim for tonight's talk. This is um, the last of the series for the fall, but uh, this, the series will continue in the spring. And uh, so, you know, look out for announcements on the Parsons and, you know, Aperture websites. Um, Lisa holds uh, a BA from Brown University and an MFA in film and video from Bard College. She also attended the independent study program at the, uh, at the Whitney Museum in New York and the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. Lisa has um, exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally. A selection of um, Lisa's work is currently on view at MoMA uh, as part of the new Photography 2013 exhibition. Um, and other recent solo exhibitions include Everyone's Camera at the Kunstverein uh, Gottingen in Germany and Heaven, Bla Heaven Blazing into the Head at The Approach in London. Her work was also included in a different kind of order uh, at the um, ICP Triennial, the International Center for Photography in New York. She has also appeared in group shows at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, Deutsche Guggenheim Berlin, Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, and the New Museum in New York, amongst many others. Her first monograph will be published uh, next year by Sternberg Press. Uh, Lisa is based in New York. Uh, so please help me uh, in giving a welcome to Lisa. Well, um, thanks, Arthur, and thanks, Aperture, for inviting me here tonight. And um, I'm going to start with um, a film, kind of a film installation, um, and reading a text. Yeah, can we can we kill the lights? Um, so I'm actually just going to read a text I wrote for a show I did in Amsterdam in the fall. Um, point to gaze. Some men active in the first half of the 19th century who figure in the present, or at least who are present in my work by way of the technologies they invented. Charles Babbage and his analytical engine, whose great unfinished project was the ERPC, Joseph Marie Jacquard and his punch card driven mechanical loom, whose mechanically woven silk portrait hung over Babbage's desk, and Henry Fox Talbot, who sent early examples of his photogenic drawings of lace to his friend Jacquard for potential use in the recording and production of textile patterns. Talbot's art of fixing shadows, of positives and negatives, is rooted in the same binary logic through which 175 years later, I am sitting on a bench in the shadow of a tree, typing these words in zeros and ones on my laptop, on my lap. In a letter sent to Babbage in 1839, Talbot writes about showing a photogram of lace to a group of friends and asking them whether it was a good representation. They replied they could not be so easily fooled, for it was evidently no picture but the piece of lace itself. Like the audience running away from the train coming towards them in the first film screening of the Lumiere's arriving train. Logged on to Facebook a few days ago, I saw a curator friend I've never met had posted an image with a question. Black smoke on the 59th Street Bridge. What happened? There were six likes and no answers. Smoke, but no fire. This is the fire I used in my dark room to create the contact prints of smoke that were then scanned and reassembled to make the animation seen here. Two clips of volcanoes erupting and one of smokestack fumes found on the web and exported to 35 millimeter motion picture film, seen from a window in one of the administration offices of MoMA, pictured with an iPhone and posted immediately. Two floors below, a different articulation of this project is on display in a windowless gallery. 
Ada Lovelace, daughter of Lord Byron, wrote that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. The women makers and inventors, however, do not have names. Their labor recorded only in stitches. An early 20th century Belgian census could not account for the number of lace makers in Belgium because it was considered leisure work. A patterned order of flower motifs a patterned order of flower motifs constructed from the presence and absence of light, like zeros and ones. So, um, I wanted to kind of show those things together just to give kind of sense of my approach to research, in a way. How uh, there's, um, well, there's always this sort of back and forth between the way, the sort of the history and the, um, and the sort of conditions around the material production of the image and the making of the image of itself. And um, so I thought maybe the best way to, um, okay, thanks. I thought the best way to sort of give, to kind of uh, perform that relationship was was through this, um, this sort of this this kind of collage of different um, of uh, of different sort of text sources and then the images that are created, kind of both from them and through them. And then kind of as I work on projects, the, um, the, the structure of the, uh, of the research and then the, the sort of the, the technical experiments of how to make something kind of go, go back and forth. So one really produces the other. So, like the, so that's sort of the way I think about research, not as sort of s as something that comes before the making of the project and then you make a project, but rather the sort of the structure of the research and then the form of the project both sort of go back and forth and inform each other through the making. Um, and a lot of my work kind of deals with this moment in early photography, I think, um, sort of dealing with figures like you'll see in the the first body of work that I'm going to show is very much sort of informed by Henry Fox Talbot. And um, I think it's because sort of this moment in early photography, like sort of um, pre-code film, I find very interesting because it's, it's like there are no rules that, or there's no really material that's even been really fixed yet. So there's a lot of experimentation going on and thinking about this in relationship to, even though I don't think any of these people really thought of themselves as artists in the way that we think of, or I think of myself as an artist. Um, that there's this sort of kind of openness and experimentation in terms of what, uh, what process, like what, what are possible processes. It's not really a given yet as to what, um, what even making a photograph means or what it entails technically. So I see this as a very kind of fertile and open moment to insert my own interests into, um, even if my own interests somehow kind of at points diverge from like, you know, classical ideas around early photography. Um, so this is, this is an installation of how that animation was seen in Basel um, this summer. And I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna recreate this also in a show in the spring in Mass Mocha. Hmm? Um, no, I mean how what 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 how this is installed? It's in like um, it's in like an uh, the top floor of an old army barracks, and so the room is like a hundred feet long and about thirty feet wide. So each of these is like um, four meters, which is about fif 15 feet across, and two and a half meters, or two and a quarter meters, and which is, I guess, around 10 feet high. Um, and they're rear projected screens, so you can actually be in the middle of the space 
and see and see both. And um, yeah, and then, so this was sort of I kind of created this piece for that particular space. And what's nice about the way I'm going to represent the work at Mass Mocha is that the space I'm going to show it in has very similar proportions. Um, so this sort of moves on. So. Um, Um, so as I was talking about before, um, um, in my process, um, an engagement with materials and engagement with ideas sort of happens simultaneously and they um, and both kind of engagements inform each other. Um, for example, in these lace works, I was interested not only in Fox Talbot and early photography, but labor and particularly the labor of women. Um, I kind of came across these um, these really intricate, and I, I was actually how it happened was I was in a, I was in a, the Applied Arts Museum in Vienna last year, two years ago, and um, or I guess it was like yeah, I guess it was two years ago, and uh, there was like this lace exhibition, and it just totally blew me away. Like just looking at the just the amount of unattributed labor that went into making these, like anonymous pieces that people just either found in flea markets or was theoretically made by someone's great, great aunt, but you weren't sure. And um, and this is something that really interested me. Um, they just interested me in op as objects. And then kind of through these objects, I came to Fox Talbot and um, sort of in the research of this, these lace, these, you know, these pieces of lace, they were, they were made, you know, usually by women for their daughter's weddings for, you know, it's kind of a dowry, you know, you get like a chest full of this stuff. And, um, and of course, like with the Industrial Revolution, a lot of this labor was sort of trans transformed into a kind of mass reproducible kind of, um, into, into mass reproducible textiles. And so this also had a relationship to photography, I thought, in terms of its sort of mass reproducibility at, at one moment, you know. And this is sort of the moment where Talbot comes in, because he, as far as I know, he seems to be one of the f first photographers to really think about photography in terms of its reproducibility, um, creating this idea of a positive and a negative, for example. So, um, and, um, and like the way that this has to do with labor is something that I was thinking about also in terms of the sort of advent of the industrialization of textiles. And, um, and so I was thinking about ways to represent, the, on one hand, this kind of abstraction that happens, or like kind of as I'm making it, I was sort of thinking about this sort of abstraction of labor, both in a kind of Marxist sense, and also the abstraction of the labor on the in the sort of like immediate sense of res of you know going to a flea market in London and getting this piece of lace and having no idea where it comes from, but having it be obviously made with so much love and care by probably some woman for her daughter. So what I kind of did to enact this sense, um, or this kind of, um, this abstraction was I, I, is I folded it. I folded this piece of lace and did sort of multiple exposures. So this is two folds of a three meter long piece of lace. And this is four folds. Or, or this is, a, sorry, that's two folds, three folds. Four folds. So, so what happens is is that this pattern starts to kind of abstract itself. So, this again is the sort of relationship between kind of going back and forth between sort of like these kind of th these these ideas, you know, around the work, and then the sort of material engagement with the work, and thinking about this process of folding as a kind of physical activity that's somehow a kind of performance that's unseen, that kind of exists outside the frame. So um, in general, in the last five years or so, 
I've worked to collapse the way that images are made and what they're about. Um, in this lace work, the way, um, the way in which the patterns become abstracted through a kind of physical labor is connected to larger ideas around labor and abstraction. And um, in the smoke series, which is, consists of both the animation that you saw and also um, still photographs, um, it's fire that produces the smoke that you see, but the fire exists outside the frame. And then the fire is then sort of reintroduced by me in the dark room as that which exposes the paper. So again, it's like um, this sort of activity or performance that you see outside of the frame is also what both um, um, both is 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 how images are made. It's about, um, and it sort of has to do with what they depict. So there's this sort of relationship again between how images are made and what they represent. Um, and um, in both of these bodies of work, I'm trying to draw attention to what is outside the frame, how photography can not only represent by pointing to what is in an image, but by also pointing to what's outside of it in terms of the conditions that produce it historically, materially, otherwise. So again, it's sort of like not, hopefully, I want to, I mean, the, what I'm thinking about in my own work is like looking at the photograph not as just a discrete object, but it's almost like um, as a lens to look at things that you can't, that are, aren't visible in the image itself. Um, another kind of thing that's sort of apparent in this work and in other work that you'll see of mine throughout the lecture is that um, my training is actually an experimental film. So I think a lot about photography as a time-based medium, um, both in terms of the sort of the, um, the moment between when a photograph is taken and how it's viewed, and also the sort of act of viewing a photograph, or in this case, uh, kind of kind of accumulation or kind of an image that sort of deconstructs itself as something that happens over time. Um, and this kind of leads me to the, um, another um, image. This is an installation photograph from the ICP Triennial of the Smoke series. Um, and um, so again, like something that was really important to me about this iteration of the project was the titles, because the titles sort of located these otherwise kind of abstract images in a particular moment, and also kind of positioned them more in a kind of documentary context. Because um, most of the, I mean, the, the images from the animation I sourced from Shutterstock, which is just sort of like an amateur, um, like it's a like amateur footage website where you can kind of n download. I mean, you have to pay for it, but it's just like anyone can kind of post footage, and anyone can pay pay for it and use it in their own work. And um, and so I'm kind of I'm kind of interested in these kind of uh, accessible archives, like not thinking about archives as dusty libraries, but thinking about archives is anywhere where um, information or images are kind of made available to a public in some way. And so um, I work a lot with like, you know, the Library of Congress and Flickr and these different kinds of, um, these different kind of repositories of images. Um, and so, what I've done in these in these works is just taken the titles directly from the source images, and in the case of this is the one all all the way to the to the right, which was from the Library of Congress, and the title is um, "A Monstrous Column of Roaring Flame, Star Oil Company Lock Number Three, on Fire Since August Seventh, Nineteen Thirteen." most disastrous fire in Cato oil field and largest single well fire in the history of US of A. Daily loss of oil estimated at 30,000 barrels, 1913 slash 2012. So of course 1913 is the year the image was taken and the 
2012 was the year that it was sort of reprocessed by me. And the one next to it, second from the right, um, ah, is, come on. Oh, Shiza. Um, was, here we go, um, uh, billowing. As we were driving up to Norfolk yesterday, I saw the Enfield fire, where a Sony distribution center set ablaze by rioters was just pouring smoke over the, mortar, over the motorway. The sheer amount of smoke was quite surprising, and today smoke was still covering the motorway. I feel such despair at people who have taken to looting, so angry at the destruction people can cause. 2011 slash 2012. And this was just from a, a Flickr image I found of the London riots and the, just the caption that someone had written. And there's something about this sort of, the one hand, like these captions have these really strong voice, the other hand, they're kind of anonymous. There's something about that that I found interesting. And so this is sort of um, um, the next iteration of the uh, lace work. Um, so, um, so rather than thinking about like, um, so, I mean, again, what I was doing in this project is taking larger pieces of fabric and, um, and making photograms by doing kind of multiple exposures by folding the, the, the material over the paper at different angles. And so rather than sort of being, you know, creating a kind of abstraction of, you know, around... Um, particular relationship around labor, which is what I think kind of the lace to me were more about. And, and with these works, um, which I are called Fish Scales, Veritable Hollandaise, which is just the name of the fabric I used, it was more about a kind of disorientation produced around this sort of like a weird history behind this fabric, which was um, this, uh, when I lived in Holland, I was sort of interested, I kind of, I don't know how I came across it, but there is, there's like this Dutch company called Blisco that makes um, um, textiles exclusively for a West African market or West African di diasporic communities. Um, and I was like, that's so weird, you know? And um, I did a little research into this Company and what it was is that they, you know, the Dutch were, you know, had uh, a lot of colonies and they were big traders and uh, they were the kind of they were the colonial power of Indonesia for, in Indonesia for many years and um, what no one is exactly sure of the story but the sort of the, the sort of narrative that I kind of um, believe is that there were these. Um, Dutch traders in Indonesia who picked up these like batik fabrics, which are traditional Indonesian fabrics, and were like kind of on their way back to Holland and stopped in West Africa for trade or whatever, um, and um, had these fabrics and saw that the you know, local people went kind of nuts for them, and so they were kind of bringing these batik wax fabrics, wax printed fabrics back from Indonesia. And then someone on one of the boats was like, why are we schlepping these all the way from Indonesia? Holland is closer, let's just make them there. And so since like the mid 19th century, they've been making these, this sort of, this these fabric um, made from this sort of traditional Indonesian techniques. Um, and selling them to West Africa. And, uh, and it was also this sort of reverse in the way that I, you know, you, one sort of thinks about uh, the production of textiles as kind of going from the third world to the first world. These are going from first world to the third world. So there was something about a kind of confusion created around that that I thought was also um, kind of, I was sort of working through in the 
in this sort of abstraction of this fabric through these folds. So you can see, like, depending on the angle of the fold, you get very different kinds of, of patterns. So it's a, kind of create these weird mores. And um, so I'm kind of going back more or less in time through this. So these, these works are all from two th the sort of the last, everything you've seen is from the last two years, pretty much. Um, and this is a slightly different body of work. Um, these are lunograms. I, I mean, I just called them lunograms, but they are, um, they are uh, again, it's sort of working with this idea which sort of, I think, kind of started with this project. Maybe I actually didn't, but this is a different iteration of this, the sort of ideas around collapsing um, the way that images are made with what they represent. So in this case, I've been using image, um, I was looking at um, the first images taken of the moon by um, John Draper. Ha 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 ha, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, and so I found these images in the in like um because he also was like a professor of chemistry at NYU and um, so I found these uh they had like a they had a bunch of his glass negatives in the NYU archive and I uh, scanned them and made these sort of contact prints I uh, made these sort of large largish scale <laughs> negatives made contact prints and then made, um, exposed them to moonlight, which is really just, I think, ambient city light on my roof of my studio. And then I got kicked out because I brought my dog. And um, then, um, and so I would expose these to moonlight for just a few, you know, like 30 seconds. And um, kind of theoretically, in the phase of the moon that was represented in the picture, so um, sort of starting from from the new moon to you know full moon and you know the whole cycle. Although I also realized that I actually printed these backwards. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and. Um, so, and then I, um, and then I kind of, you can't really tell on these images, but then uh, the next step that I did to give them that little kind of magic quality is um, I used a kind of silver toning, I used a uh, silver toning process, which sort of replaced the silver gelatin in the paper with metallic silver. So the white parts of the image look silver. And of course, what I was thinking about this is the relationship kind of the alchemical relationship between silver and the moon. So th these are all installation shots. And um, then there was like a really fucked up negative that you couldn't see anything on. And so I, did, I made that the new moon. I decided it was. Um, and so that's what that pairing is. And um, so that project is from 2010, which sort of led me to a kind of sister project in 2011 that uh, um, called, I called heliograms. So the son of John Draper, Henry Draper, I found this image that in the Smithsonian archive that he had made for an emperor of Brazil of the sun in, 18, in 1860, 1876. Well, and the way that I title these also is the, is 18, is like, you know, Lunograms 1851 slash 2010, because of course it's the date that they're made, and then there's the date that I made them. Um, and so these images are um, heliograms, so it's an image of the sun from 1876. And what I did is I, you know, through, you know, I made um, contact prints basically just in using. Uh, photo paper and uh, a, a million neutral density filters because if you just expose photo paper to the sun, you, it disappears. So I just like basically put like four, four or five dark neutral density filters on them. 
and expose them to, um, to sunlight at different times of the day and depending on the length of exposures and how many filters I put on, it would be kind of more or less of an intense image. Um, and I used a kind of warm tone paper to, you know, but use the same sort of silver toning process. So you get a sense that their images are kind of goldish and that of course has to do with the relationship between gold and the sun. So each line in this case represents exposures made over the course of the day. And so in the morning, there's less sun, so the exposures are less intense, and then like throughout the day, they kind of get more intense, and the blank spots on the wall are like times of the day where I, well, I was actually trying to like be good about it and like do them every two hours or so, or you know, whenever there was sort of available sunlight over the course of the day in a kind of time sequence that made sense, but I got very lazy or I just messed up and I decided just to incorporate that into the piece in a way. So, so for instance, um, these are all exposures of um, from the month of April in 2011. And so like that would be like around 7.30 in the morning, that would be around nine, that would be around 11. That would be, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And so, like, maybe there is when I'm having lunch or taking my dog out or doing something and or mm, oversleeping or having dinner or something, you know. So I decided to sort of structure this sort of, this sort of diary aspect of it into the work itself. So each line is one day, and each image represents an exposure at a particular moment in time. So again, there's this sort of element of marking time. These are three days exposures in I don't know, May. These are three days of exposures in, in June. Um, and then, um, so kind of going back now a little bit to 2010 with a much different kind of work. Um, this is a, so yeah, I mean, again, my training is in film and I've always kind of been drawn to working in 16, although maybe, maybe the days of 16 are, are done and it's not a battle I want to fight anymore, but, um, um, and I was very kind of influenced by the films and photographs too of Hollis Frampton, which is probably an artist a lot of you know. And um, so this is a film, kind of a little bit of a homage to Hollis Frampton, um, and it's called Cafe. So I think I just want to. Sh it's seven minutes long. So I want to show a digital version of it and then talk about it a little bit.
So I'll just, there's one more cycle left, but I'll just start talking about it through it. Um, so this, this film st um, started with an idea I had that came from, um, it's reading a lot of Ezra Pound and um, and Hollis Frampton was also very influenced by Ezra Pound, and you know Ezra Pound was you know crazy, um, really crazy, and <laughs> and he um, was also a racist, anti-Semitic, fascist, you know, crazy guy, and um, so um, I, I became interested in his ideas around translation. So he, he produced a book of poems called Cafe, which were um, his, uh, his idea of what, um, uh, his, his translations of um, like ninth century Chinese poems. And of course, like he couldn't really um, speak Chinese, but he thought that Chinese was like a pictographic language. So just by looking at it, you could translate um, and so he made these really beautiful poems that weren't really exactly translations, but you know they they were. He was using a kind of strategy that was not a hundred percent off. So there was like a little because they were kind of based on these translations of someone else's also. So there was a slight bit of accuracy, but I, I became sort of interested in in this um, in this relationship between Pound's translation of these po of these poems and what they actually were. So I found like a fragment of a poem that um, Pound had translated, and I sent the fragment, uh, it was in, in, in Chinese, and I sent it to, a, to um, an East a Asian languages professor at NYU, and I asked him to make a kind of correct translation. So what you see on one side with the, um, um, with the, no, let me do this. Uh, with the or with the um, with the purple text is Pound's translation, which slowly then gets replaced with images that I took in Chinatown. So thinking about Chinatown as like you know a site of this cultural translation, um, and on the other side of the screen, it's the. Um, it's the sort of quote unquote correct translation by the um, by the professor, and so what you have is then um, these images that start off on so first the screen starts off on the left hand screen with pounds text and images um, um, that are based on the text of the of the correct translation, and then slowly pounds text disappears and then the images from the um, from the correct translation are replaced with the text from the correct translation and so it's basically I was thinking about the sort of the sort of how how actually kind of kind of going through a city like New York or going through any kind of international city you have these moments of constant cultural translation and trying to kind of enact that in a piece. So that's what I was thinking about with that film. And um, so this is another film that I'm not gonna show, but it's, a, it's an animation so you can kind of get the sense of it. And uh, this again is a, is a much different, it's also a double 16 millimeter film. I think I've made a bunch of double films I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it has to do with this, I don't know, there's some, there's some idea of doubling in cinema that has always really resonated with me. Um, maybe text image relationship, I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I even curated a show at the, at the ICA in London called Double, which was all double 16 millimeter film projections. And I couldn't like, really make a good thesis of why my own films and these other films I liked were were double sixteen millimeter films, but for some reason that's always been a kind of kind of I think it's like you know maybe when you get ice cream and you can't decide which flavor, so you kind of get a swirl. 
It might be, if you don't want to really foreground one aspect of what you're working on, so doing a, a double projection is sort of a cheap shot of letting multiple things come at the same time. Um, so uh, this, this piece is called uh, No Closer to the Source. And um, this was actually the really, I think, the first work that, um, that, that I did that really sort of starts to deal with the, um, with, the um, with this sort of idea of collapse between the way that images are made and what the piece is about. And so th this work is from 2008. And what I did is I um, started with, I got like a copy of the Whole Earth Catalog, which people probably know. It's sort of like, you know, before there was an internet, it's how you Googled things, kind of. And, um, and there's this image called Earthrise, which, which is, of course, a very famous image of the Earth taken from the first lunar landing. And... Um, and I just sort of like, kind of like got interested in this picture and started Googling around it and, um, and sort of found these images on Flickr that people took the night of the first lunar landing in their, in their house, you know, of like lots of pictures of the TV. And then I found these other pictures that people would take of the moon. And so, that, um, which I thought was really weird, you know, like this idea of just taking a picture of the moon and just happens to be on that night. And so um, I kind of got interested by this, also like looking at this Earthrise picture. So it's like the pictures of the moon, someone t in their backyard in New Jersey taking a photograph of the moon, and someone in, you know, you know, on the moon taking a picture of the Earth, and the sort of simultaneity of that experience and how kind of media is used to sort of get closer to things, or I was thinking about like the the close up or the use of a close up as a way to you know this sort of illusion of be, being both sort of physically and emotionally closer to a character in a film or something, and um, and how that's obviously just a cinematic construction. And so I was thinking about this, and then also thinking about Xerox machines. I don't know why, but. Um, so then I took both of these images, the image of the moon taken from someone's backyard that evening, and an image from the, the Earthrise image, and I Xeroxed each image at 101%, thinking what was going to happen is that you would zoom into the image and the image would fall apart because it's like Xeroxing a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. But actually what ended up happening was way cooler, which was that the image started to move off the page because Xerox machines are not exactly the most um, you know, exact uh, devices. So basically what, it ha what happened was, here, I, can give you, I can give you another little look at that if it, if it lets me. Um, so w what happened is like instead of zooming into the image, it sort of zoomed to some, into the center of the image, it zoomed into some other point. So, um, oops. so, so what? So what happened was is that you would get this kind of um, look, like this kind of illusion. Like when I produced the animation of, like you know, flying over the moon, kind of. And so I was like, oh, that's weird and cool. And so then the film just ended when um, when the image just totally went off the page. So it's like, you know, two, two images from either side kind of coming together to produce a sort of synchronic landscape. How long did the entire film? It's very short, like a minute. I just couldn't figure out how to get it into this presentation. <laughs> so <laughs> and um, so um, this is kind of... Uh, Slightly earlier work from 2007, 2008. And this is sort of begins my, like this is I think the first time where I'm starting to look really at these sort of historical processes and, and, um, and photography um, kind of in relationship to other things that I was thinking about. So this, in, this, in this project, uh, these, are, these are zebra chromes 
which I don't think are actually even m done anymore, really. Um, and um, I was sort of interested in the way that the first, that James Clerk Maxwell produced the first color images by photographing a tartan through a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. So what I did is I um, kind of, I think this is, this is sort of when my work maybe was more, or attempting to be more explicitly addressing politics in some way. Um, where I just, I found like in a flea market, I found these um, crayons from the 60s and there was like a flesh colored crayon and I was like, <gasps> weird. And you can't do that anymore. And thinking about how strange it was and then kind of doing some research into this and of course, you know, in the 60s, Crayola had to stop making flesh colored crayons. So flesh colored and so, uh, and then they kind of reemerged in the 90s as multicultural crayons. And I also, f I just found that even weirder. So, um, so I was thinking about like deconstructing color in a kind of very elemental way in photography. And so I was thinking about James Clerk Maxwell and the sort of photographing these tartans through a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. And I kind of did the same thing with these Crayola colors. Um, photographing them through a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. And then sort of, um, so this is sort of like uh, the reason why I needed to do Cibrochromes, I thought, was that it's like this color additive process, RGB. So it didn't really work using kind of, you know, a negative positive uh, system. So. Um, the, so I projected each slide separate, and, and I kind of didn't put them in the negative carrier in the right way. So the places where they overlap is the actual color, and then the, all the other colors are all, like all the other colors that go into making them. So this one is apricot. Uh, this one is, you, know, you kind of can't see in the projection, but it's tan. That one is salmon, which I call um, a sunburnt British tourist, and uh, and this is this is an installation of them in a show. Um, the one on the right is silver, which of course refers to hair. So there's I mean periwinkle. I mean, I think that was like I called that one Elizabeth Taylor eyes. You know, like I mean the colors are all kind of ridiculous, but I was sort of interested in this process. And so the last project I want to show you tonight is um, a project that I started in also in 2007 and continued through 2009 that was based on um, images I found in the Library of Congress of Walker Evans. So um, these are kind of the outtakes from Hale County, his images in Hale County, Alabama, which were used and let us now, it's the same kind of three families that he photographed um, and James A.G. wrote about and let us now praise famous men. And so, and so these, these are like the outtakes and the, the um, probably a lot of you know that the, uh, that the photo editor of the Farm Security Administration was a guy named Roy Stryker who would punch holes in negatives he didn't want printed. And um, a lot of artists have actually used this archive, but I think I was actually the first. <laughs> um, and um, or, I mean, probably wasn't the first, but I was uh, earlier than others. <laughs> and then, um, and uh, so, um, so what I was so so what I became interested in, of course, I mean, of course, Sherry Levine used it, and. Um, so I was interested in these Sherry Levine, the, this, the way that Sherry Levine re-photographed the Walker Evans images, and then um, was also sort of then interested in so thinking about the sort of history of appropriation and my relationship to it. I was a student at the time that I started this, um, and also thinking about these holes that Stryker made as sort of peepholes through which you could kind of look into the future. So I was thinking about this sort of the absence, the sort of damage in the images as sort of a generative space. So I kind of went out and kind of photographed things that I thought could be in the holes. Sometimes it's kind of obvious like this, 
and then sometimes it was a little less obvious to me. Like I found out like that that tree was a southern pine, but I didn't know exactly what kind of pine it was. So like, so I went to a like a pine reserve in Long Island, and I photographed a couple different kinds of southern pine. So I wanted to keep, and I also liked when there's like three dots, it creates sort of an ellipsis. So it's sort of like a continuation. So it's not just like filling in the holes, it's kind of creating a potential of different other kinds of possibilities of reading this. I mean, and sometimes it's kind of obvious why it's an outtake, like you've got like a chicken that, a rooster that bombed the photograph, you know, so, and sometimes it's a little less obvious why an image was rejected. That's an installation. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, sure. Tough crowd. Um, yeah, at the start of your lecture, you said that uh, you were inspired by the, um, by the approach of early photographers because their approach was more free because, of course, they did not define photography yet. But in this era uh, where photography is defined, do you feel limited, limited as a photographer that you sort of have to respond on the ongoing discourse in the dogma of photography, if you know what I mean? Um, I, you know, I think that there is like, you know, I think it's like one of those things where, it's also maybe because I never really studied photography formally, I never really knew what the canon was, so I just sort of made it up as I, you know what I mean? So, like, I, I never felt there was anything particular that I needed to respond to outside of my own particular set of interests, which is why, like, for instance, as opposed to, like, experimental film or video, which I felt, like, almost at some point, like, petrified by because I was, like, too involved in it, like, the, the sort of discourse around photography and the sort of questions around it were not particularly questions that I was engaged with in any kind of academic way or even really interested in. So it was a kind of liberating medium for me to, to, to get involved in because I didn't really have any particular investment in it. So in that way, it's like what the sort of contemporary debates in photography are, I feel like I can remove myself from in some way because it's just like, you know, I'm kind of interested in what I'm interested in, and then you kind of forge your own path through that. 